Western and Idaho. My dad still farms and runs some cows. Um, and I ended up going to school. I went to three different colleges. I went to Ricks College in Rexburg, and I went up to the University of Idaho and got a bachelor's degree in ag engineering. And then I uh, went on to Utah State and got a master's degree in irrigation engineering. Um, just out of college, I worked for a civil engineering consulting firm specializing in pumps and water systems. I uh, worked for the Idaho Department of Ag for several years in their engineering department. And um, uh, currently, I'm involved, involved with energy efficiency and irrigation systems. And so most of the work I do right now is for utilities, where I uh, contact the utility to evaluate irrigation pumps on their system for energy efficiency and look for energy saving opportunities. So that's just a little bit about my background. Um, just kind of get into the presentation here. I'm not sure. Oh. There we go. I'm not sure what the best way will be to handle questions. If you have your phone muted, I guess just unmute and speak up. Or I don't know if there's a way to raise your hand or do something here with the go to meeting, but whatever works best, just try and get my attention and we'll stop. You can raise your hand um, and, and, oh, I don't know, if, actually, I, I guess that's just a webinar function. So basically, if you want to get um, his attention, you do need to unmute yourself and then just say something. <laughs> okay, that, uh, that works for me. So anyway, this first slide, I just want to talk about different types of irrigation pumps. There are a lot of different types of pumps in general but there are really just two or three main types that you see on irrigation systems. The first one is a centrifugal pump, and that's the pump here shown in this first picture. Um, the, another type is a turbine pump, or a vertical turbine pump, it will, it will be called, a vertical line shaft turbine. And the second picture with the red pump and blue pump, they kind of show what a, a vertical turbine pump would look like. And then the third type is a submersible turbine. It basically works the same as a vertical turbine, except for the motor that drives the pump is on the bottom of the pump. It's actually down in the well or in, in the water, uh, in your pump pit, wherever you're pumping from. And so that's the major difference there. The vertical turbines, um, the motor or drive is at the top of the well or above ground, and the submersible turbine, the motor, is at the bottom. And so that's the main difference. We'll talk about those a little bit more as we go through. Um, here's just a, another picture closer up of the centrifugal pump. Basically, a pump, what it does is it adds energy to water. And so it usually does that um, by uh, rotating what we call an impeller. This cutout uh, shows kind of how the pump works. It shows the what inside the pump and it shows some of the terms. And so basically you have a, an intake of your pump, or they call it the suction side of the pump, where the water is coming into the pump, usually from a disc or another pipeline or from another pump potentially, depending on the situation. Um, anyway, the water usually comes in at low pressure, unless, a, unless it's a booster pump, of course, and we can talk about those later. But then inside the pump, you have an impeller that turns, it rotates, and the water enters the eye of the impeller, or the inside of the impeller, and exits the outside. And so as that turns, it, it increases the velocity of the water and, that <clears throat> water and adds energy to the water. Then the water exits the pump on the discharge side or the pressure side at a higher pressure and velocity. Um, some of the turns while we're looking here, this is the pump casing is this outside portion of the pump that holds the impeller. Um, this is the upstream pipe flange. This is where you would hold on your suction pipe. And then this is the downstream pipe flange where you would hold on your pipe that goes to your system or connect to your system. Um, the other thing it shows, most of these centrifugal pumps will have an arrow <clears throat> on the outside of the casing showing the direction that it, the, the impeller turns. And then this shows different types of impellers. There are several different types. 
um, the, the two that are shown here are a closed type impeller and an open type. And the kind that is shown is actually what we would refer to as a semi-open impeller. A closed impeller has a casing on both sides. And so the water enters the center of the impeller and exits the outside. And, there's, and it just has to go through right through the impeller. Um, that's probably the most efficient impeller type, really. Um, one issue is if you're pumping water with a lot of solids or some particles in it, you could have some problems with clogging with that type of impeller. Um, and that's uh, one application where they use more of an open type impeller, <clears throat> like the second one shown. And so that actually still will add energy to the system. It's usually not quite as efficient. And the operating characteristics depend on how tight the clearances are adjusted in between the impeller and the casing. And so, so on some turbine pumps, you can adjust those clearances. And we'll talk about that maybe on one of the next slides where I show a cutout of the, of the turbine pump. Um, one Another term the, that's kind of specific to pumps or pump impellers is trim. So well, these pumps have a certain diameter, and their output depends on the diameter of the impeller. And so if you want to change the operating characteristics of the, the pump, you can trim the impeller. And that means you just basically machine the impellers down so the diameter is not as big. And by doing that, you'll change how that pump will operate. And we'll look at those a little bit more, too, as we look at pump curves a little bit later on. Are there any questions to this point? All right, if not, um, we'll just continue. Here's a, another picture of a centrifugal pump and how it works, kind of just a cutout diagram. It shows the water coming in through the suction side of the pump. It shows the pump impeller. This would be an open impeller actually, and water enters and exits on the outside of the casing, like I said before, at a higher velocity, and that is converted into pressure. Um, this other side just shows how we're kind of connected to the motor, how we have a, a shaft that comes through, and there's a bearing, and, and there's some uh, uh, packing in a stuffing box that just prevents water from leaking back through. Or, maybe not always prevents it, but it slows it down anyway. <clears throat> Here's a picture of some turbine pumps. Those other pumps were centrifugal pumps. Um, turbine pumps, like I say, as I said before, generally have the motor up on top. Um, sometimes they're called a, a line shaft turbine. That means that they have a shaft that goes down from the motor down to the pump bowl. And so a couple of terms here, um, when you talk about pump bowls, you're basically, basically talking about the casing around each of the impellers for each of the stages of the pump. And then stages is just how many different pump bowls and impellers you have. And so for example, this blue pump um, would, have th it would be a three-stage pump. It has three bowls or three impellers. And the idea is that the water and this type of pump would enter through the screen at the bottom, and it would enter the first stage, and a certain amount of energy would be added to the water, and then it would, it would enter the second stage, which would add additional energy. And basically, as you're moving through the stages, you have the same volume of flow moving through the pump, but you're adding more pressure with each stage. And so you can kind of design your pump with a certain number of stages depending on how much pressure you need. Uh, this blue picture, this blue pump here, shows uh, the motor mounted directly on top of the pump, a shaft coming from the motor down into the pump, and we'll see a cutout of this in a minute too. Um, this other one looks like the motor is more of a gear system, and you have a shaft coming out of the side, and so it's probably not driven directly by an electric motor. Um, it's probably driven by a diesel motor that sits off to the side. And we'll see an example of those, too. 
overhead that shows the, the pump with some different impellers. This first impeller would be a closed impeller. Second one would be a semi-open impeller, and then the third one would be another closed impeller. Just kind of a good picture of that. Here's the cutout. I guess it's not really clear, but it'll help us explain maybe some of the other terms and kind of show how a turbine pump works. So you have your driver or your motor up on top of the pump. You have a pump head, it's called, that sits underneath your motor. And that's where your discharge pipe is connected. And then you have a shaft that goes from the motor clear down to wherever the bolts are at. And that can be 600 feet if it's a, a deep well pump, or it can just be four or five feet if you're pumping from a, a surface water source or a ditch. Um, this shaft, we already talked about stages and bowls. This shaft is usually a steel shaft, and it's enclosed in a tube and it runs down to the bowl and it has bearings along the way uh, just to keep it kind of centered and make it work good. Um, the other term that you might encounter with turbine pumps is spiders. Um, that just basically holds the, the shaft in place and the casing around the shaft in place. And so they'd be spaced down along the casing and they would make sure that everything stays centered. And sometimes you'll have those in, in a pump, you'll have them inside of the discharge pipe of the pump holding the, the shaft casing in place, and you'll actually have them inside of a well holding the, the discharge pipe in place inside the well casing too. Um, the other thing is the screen, usually at the bottom of all the turbine pumps, will have some type of a screen that will filter the water as it comes in, and that usually sits right at the bottom. I'll just maybe go back to that previous shot. You can see the screen for both of these ones there at the bottom. I tried to add a lot of pictures in, so I thought that would maybe be more helpful in explaining, kind of showing uh, different types of pumps, and it might be more interesting to look at than if I just type up. Uh, hopefully that helps. Um, here's the picture. Yeah, is there a question? No, no, I don't think so. Sorry. Okay. Um, and here's a picture of a submersible turbine. And like I said, it works the same as a turbine, basically. Um, you have several different stages or bowls, but the motor is now at the bottom of your well um, and at the bottom of the pump. So you have a lot shorter shaft. Um, from your motor to, to drive your impellers, which is one benefit. Um, the, I guess probably the disadvantage to that is if you have problems with the motor itself, it's not up on top of the ground where you can just pull the motor off and work on it at the bottom of the well. And so you have to pull the whole, all the casing and the whole pump out to be able to work on it. Um, so the motor, you basically, on the discharge side, you don't have the shaft inside of your discharge piping, so you can have less friction loss that way, and, and so that's another advantage. And so basically, you have your motor, you have your intake screen just above your motor, between your motor and the pump hole, and then you have your pump hole like a vertical curve. Uh, these diagrams show different um, scenarios where this might be used. The first one is in the, it looks like a well where you have your water coming up through the well casing and then through the screen of the pump and then up to your discharge point. Um, this one would just be some type of a pump pit um, that you're pumping out of. And the third one would be if you were connecting to a, a pipeline and using this pump probably as a booster pump, you could set it up that way where your pump inside the casing where you're connected to a pipeline. We talked about some of these advantages and, and disadvantages already a little bit, um, but just maybe to emphasize um, when you would use a centrifugal pump, or what might be some advantages of a centrifugal pump over a turbine or a turbine over a centrifugal. Um, some of the advantages of a centrifugal pump are that the pump and motor and everything's above ground. And so if you need to work on it, um, we saw that you just basically have a 
an intake flange and a discharge flange, and you can unbolt it and remove the pump and, and work on it pretty easy. And so that might make maintenance easier. Uh, one other advantage of centrifugal pumps is that they have a flat pump curve. And we'll talk about this more later, but what that basically means is if your flow changes, um, if you, for some reason, have a reduction in flow of your system, on, on your system, you will not get a huge spike in pressure um, with a flat pump curve pump. And so you'll get some type of pressure increase that may not be as big as it would be with the turbine pump. They usually have what we call a steeper curve. <clears throat> and we'll look at pump curves a little bit later on. I can show you kind of what that means. One disadvantage to some typical pumps, one thing that I've I've had a couple of people that I've worked with lately that want to swap out some critical pumps for turbine pumps is because they have to prime them. So if you are lifting water out of a ditch or canal, and you've probably seen these, where you have an intake pipe that kind of goes vertically over from the pump and then down into a ditch. In order to get that water up to the pump, a lot of times you have to prime the pump. That means you usually have a, a hand pump that you have to crank on and until you have fill your get water up into your pump, then you can just turn your pump on and it works. And so that's a little bit of an inconvenience sometimes to farmers. And so that's, I guess, would be one disadvantage. Um, advantages of the turbine pump would be no priming. Um, your pump holds are down in the water. If you don't, they're already full of water. You can just start the pump up and it runs. You don't have to prime it. Um, so that's an advantage. Another advantage is you have some flexibility by adding stages or removing stages to meet your desired operating point. And so that's kind of nice, too, with the turbine. Um, one pump dealer here in Idaho, he really promotes turbine pumps with his customers. And his reasoning is that he always has a, a lot of parts or spare parts available for turbine pumps right in his shop. So if someone's pump goes down, he can just go out and fix it. Or with the centrifugal pump, you would have to order in a new pump. So that's that's an advantage from his standpoint. Um, this is advantages of the turbine pump. Um, your pump holes are down in the water. If you need to work on them, you have to pull them out of there. <laughs> and that's there may not a big deal if you're pumping out of the ditch. But if you're pumping out of a deep well, then that can be more expensive. And of course, if you're pumping out of a deep well. Um, you really have to use a turbine pump. The triple pump is not good for that application because you have to lift the water so high. And so a turbine pump is really a well pump. So if you're working with someone that is pumping out of well, they either have a turbine, a vertical line shaft turbine pump, or a submersible turbine pump usually. And the triple pump is only good or only really works on surface water pumping applications by pumping out of the canal or a ditch. <clears throat> um, another disadvantage of the turbine pump is a steep pump curve, and again, we'll talk about that a little bit later. It means if your flow starts to change, if you decrease your flow on your system, you can get some pretty high pressure spikes. And then uh, we talked about submersibles a little bit. One disadvantage with the submersible is your motor's down at the bottom of the well. Uh, it makes it a lot quieter if it's a city pump and you're in the residential area then that pump will be a lot quieter than the one with the motor above ground. But if something happens to that motor, you have to pull the whole pump out of the well to be able to work on it. Rick, this is Sarah. Um, can you talk about the difference in startup surges between the two pumps? Um, when you turn the pump on? Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, you know what? They, you can, the startup surge, can be about the same. Um, one thing with startup with these two pumps, with the centrifugal pump, if you have a valve downstream of the pump, and that valve is mostly closed, um, your centrifugal pump won't generate a lot of pressure, and you won't have a lot, a lot of water moving through your pump, so you, and it probably won't damage itself. If you have a turbine pump and you start it, you have a valve downstream that's closed so the water can't go anywhere, you're likely going to get a big pressure spike and you can cause um, damage to your pump. Um, does, that, does that answer your question, Sarah? Is there something else that you... No, I think that will do it for now. Thanks. Okay.
Um, <clears throat> next slide shows different pump drives and a couple more uh, pump terms there. A lot of times you'll talk about a closed couple of pumps. And the picture on the left shows a closed couple of pumps. Basically, your motor is directly connected to your pump, and your pump turns at a certain speed. Um, however fast your motor is going, it's directly connected. Um, the other picture shows a, an example of a shaft-driven pump. This would be a diesel engine that is driving this pump. It's a turbine pump, um, probably a well pump. And it has a shaft connected from the engine over to the pump that, that drives it. And there's a gearbox <clears throat> right there at the top of the, the pump, where the pump, just above the pump head where the electric motor would usually be. And so one advantage of that is you can vary your speeds on this type of pump if it's a diesel engine. Um, by varying your engine RPM, you can vary your pump speed. And that can allow for um, uh, varied loads on your system. You can match your pump speed to match the load on your system. And we'll talk a little bit more about those next time when we talk about energy savings opportunities and, and varying speeds on pumps. Um, more pump terms. Here's a well pump. A lot of times when you look at a pump, you'll hear about pumping lift. And basically what pumping lift is, it's shown in this diagram, is the distance from the pumping water level to the center line of the pump. So if you have a, a ditch pump, and your pump's sitting up on the bank beside the canal, and you want to measure pumping lift, you just measure the distance from the water surface in the canal to the center line of the pump. If you're talking about a well, it's the that same same measurement. It's basically your pumping water level in your well to the center line of the pump, not pumping lift. And so that's how much how far you have to lift the water to get it to your pump. So um, a couple other terms that are shown here, pressure. Um, pressure is usually, pumping lift is usually measured in feet. Uh, pumping pressure is usually measured in PSI here, uh, pounds per square inch. And uh, you usually measure your pressure right at the discharge of your pump. You can measure pressures anywhere in your system. But if you're trying to just see how well the pump's working and what's giving you, <clears throat> then it's best to measure the discharge of the pump. Um, static water level. If we're talking about a well, the static water level is the water level in the well um, when you're not pumping. Um, that is just your average static water level. Another term is drawdown. Drawdown is uh, the distance from the static water level to the pumping water level. And this kind of is a good diagram that shows drawdown. Um, once you turn on the pump, um, you usually, usually get some drawdown in every well. Um, I've seen some wells that have little no drawdown to a couple feet, and others have 60 feet of drawdown from the static water level. And it's really a, depends on the well and the situation where you're at. So that's drawdown. PDH, that's something really common. We're going to talk about it a lot. PDH stands for total dynamic head. Um, and it's, I have an equation on the next sheet we'll talk about it a little bit more, but it's basically a sum of your pumping lift and your pressure and any friction losses, minor friction losses that are usually on the upstream side of the pump or the suction side of the pump. Um, pump setting, that's a term specific to well pumps. It's how deep your pump is set in the well. And then the submergence is how much water you have above your pump and the pumping water level down to where your pump is set or where your pump holes are. And so most pumps require a certain amount of submergence. Um, if you if you get your pump set close to your pumping water level, a lot of times you'll get entrained air moving through your pump. And that's bad. <laughs> so you really drops the efficiency of your pump down. Um, it can it drops, drops your pump life off and you start pumping air through the pump and it's not really good for your system either. You're paying money to pump air when you want to pump water. Any questions on this diagram or this point? Uh, 
Um, there's the equation I told you about, total dynamic head, TDH, is your lift plus pressure plus minor losses. <clears throat> now your pressure is in PSI and your lift is, a, I told you, is a measurement of feet. So in order to use the equation, you have to convert pressure to feet of head. And it's a simple conversion factor. 1 PSI equals 2.31 feet of water. And so if you think about it, um, if you had a column of water, it doesn't really matter how big it is, uh, the diameter of the column, but if you think of a, a vertical column of water, if you go down 2.31 feet in that column from the water surface at the top, your pressure would be 1 PSI if you measured the pressure at that point. And it would go on, as you went down, it would increase in incrementally, uh, 2.31 feet increment for PSI. And so it's an easy conversion, but you just need to make sure if you're ever talking about TDH. Um, when we look at pump curves, you'll see that they usually report the total dynamic head and feet. And a lot of times we're wondering how much pressure we'll get out of the pump. You just need to make that conversion, and it's a, a straightforward conversion. Um, usually lift can be a major component of your total dynamic head, especially on a well pump. On a surface water pump, it's not as big. And then pressure is your other major component of lift on a pump. You do have some minor losses. Those are usually a minor component of lift. And I usually, in my calculations, I figure some minor losses in, um, maybe three or four or five feet, depending on the system. If it's a well pump, it's more. Um, but you could almost, in some cases, disregard minor losses if you wanted to do a quick calculation or just add a few feet in because they're not a really major component of the equation most of the time. The other thing we, we talked about with pumps is pumping flow rate. Um, usually it's in gallons per minute. It can be in cubic feet per second. Um, on a lot of farms, you look at it both ways. I may be out talking to a farmer and he may tell me how many inches of water he's pumping or is what his water right is in inches. And usually that's referring to miners inches. And that's the way that they used to measure measure water and it varies from state to state. And you can see here that in Idaho, 50 miners inches equals one CFS, one cubic feet per second. Um, in Montana it's different. Uh, 40 miners inches is the equivalent to one cubic feet per second of water. And so um, it varies, but as long as you know what it is in your state, you can make the conversion over. And then the conversion in between cubic feet per second and gallons per minute is uh, one cubic feet per second is 448.8 gallons per minute. If you just want to try to remember a number on top of your head, uh, 450 is pretty close. So if you ever need to make the conversion. Uh, a lot of times water rights will be listed as inches, acre feet, or cubic feet per second, and, and a lot of times when we're talking about pumping, we're talking gallons per minute, and so it's useful to be able to convert those over. Uh, pump curves. Pump curves show operating characteristics of a specific pump. Every pump has its own curve, and they can all be different, um, but the pump has to operate according to its curve. And we'll look at a couple of examples there, and I'll show you what I mean. Um, but basically, a pump curve shows the total dynamic head on one axis versus flow on another axis. And then it usually gives us efficiency and horsepower. And the best way to explain it is just to look at one. Um, I pulled up a, different, a couple different pump curves. This is, a, for instance, a centrifugal pump. It's a, Corn a Cornell pump. Um, the model number is listed at the bottom. It's a 4RB is the model number. This is really a common surface water centrifugal pump in irrigation. Um, if you look on the left-hand side of the pump, it gives us our total dynamic head in feet. And it labels it as our head in feet versus our flow rate in gallons per minute on the horizontal axis. And so I, I told you this black line is where we'll start. This is the pump curve line, this black line that comes across. And uh, the pump has to operate on the pump curve. And so 
if I'm pumping 900 gallons a minute, I can look on the horizontal axis here, I can go up, and I should be pumping at just under 160 feet of head, um, according to the curve. And now if I measure my pressure and calculate my total dynamic head and I come up with 170 feet, I could do the same thing. I could look at my pump curve and I could say, okay, I have 170 feet of head. I follow that over until I hit my pump curve and then go straight down to my flow. That tells me I would be pumping with about 650 gallons per minute at that head. And so one thing to remember is the pump has to operate on its curve. These green lines that you can see are efficiency lines. And so this is an 85% efficiency line. And so if I'm pumping around well, just over 900 gallons a minute to just over 1,100 gallons a minute, my efficiency is somewhere around 85%. Now, if I drop down and I'm just pumping over 700 gallons a minute, my efficiency is 80%. And now you can see these pump curves kind of are, are somewhat circular. The preferred operating point of the pump or the sweet point or whatever you want to call it is usually right at the bullseye. So if you can imagine that these uh, circles continued around above the pump curve as well, you kind of make a bullseye and your best efficiency point for your pump is right at the center of that bullseye. And so in this case, 85.6% efficiency would be the best efficiency point. It would be at about 1,040 gallons a minute, 1,030 gallons a minute at a TDH of 150 feet. Um, we have some other lines on the pump curve that are useful, or the horsepower lines. These dashed brown looking lines are the horsepower lines. So this is 50 horsepower. So anywhere along that line would represent 50 horsepower. And so if, if I'm looking at this top line on the pump curve, it's underneath the 50 horsepower line. I'd probably have a 50 horsepower motor on my pump if I had a Cornell 4RV um, with a 12.75 inch trim. So that's what this number is, is 12.75 inch. That's the diameter of the impeller. We talked about impeller diameters and trims. Um, and this shows pump curves for different types of impellers. Um, I mentioned that if you trim a pump impeller, it contains offering characteristics. And this pump curve represents that. This line would be for a 12 inch impeller. And so if you took that full size impeller and trimmed it down to a 12 inch diameter impeller, it would operate on this gray line here. And that would be the curve. And you're down here at this lower end, you're at about 40 horsepower. And so that'd be a 40 horsepower pump. <clears throat> Likewise, if you drop the trim to 11 inches, um, just move down, and it's a 30 horsepower pump. You see the 30 horsepower motor in that case. And now, if we look at a, a thousand gallons a minute, a full trim, my TDH is 150 feet. At a trim of 12 inches, my TDH has dropped off to 130 feet. And so that's 20 feet, um, which would be just under 10 PSI would be the difference if we talk about pressure. And then likewise, if we drop down to 11 inches, we're down here to about 100 feet of head approximately <clears throat> at 1,000 gallons per minute. And then you can trim this, uh, the very smallest recommended impeller size for this pump is 8 inches. We're down to looking at a 10 horsepower pump, um, just slightly over 10 horsepower. The efficiency, my best efficiency point for that pump is about 75%, so my efficiencies are dropping off as we trim down. And, and then as the uh, force the pressures and flows are different too. Um, this red line on the pump curve is is um, you don't want to operate the pump past that red line on the curve. So basically, it's telling us that 150 gallons per minute, if we operate our pump below 150 gallons per minute, there's a possibility that we could damage the pump. And so we don't want to operate down in that low, low flow range. And that's what this red line shows. So Rick, um, I have a, what I have a question well, on has, your yeah, do you, so is 85% efficiency on this pump then the best you're going to get? It is, yes. Okay. And is that pretty typical? It is. For new pumps, um, 
your best efficiency best efficiency point is usually around 84 to 86 percent. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah, um, at the very bottom, I didn't really um, plan on talking about this curve too much. Um, this NPSHR is called net positive suction head required, and it's uh, you probably when you're looking at pumps, you won't have to worry about it too much. It's really a design characteristic. Um, there's a certain amount of net positive suction head available for a pump, and that just depends on how the pump is set up and atmospheric conditions. And if you're designing a pump, you just need to make sure that the net positive suction head required is less than the net positive suction head available, and there's a calculation for that. But that's not something that you'll probably need to worry about. One thing that you may run into is if you look at a, and it really has to do with how far you're lifting the pump, how much atmospheric pressure is on your water surface of the water you're pumping from um, compared to how far you're lifting the water above that surface. And so, for example, if I went out and looked at a centrifugal pump that was on the, the bank of a river, and I'm trying to lift the water maybe 10 feet, most of these have lower lifts, more like four or five feet is, is probably the average. But if I was trying to lift it higher, maybe 10, 12, 15 feet, then my net positive suction head required would probably be more than what I had available, and I might get cavitation in my pump. So I guess where I'm going with this, if you go out and look at a centrifugal pump, and it sounds like rocks are moving through that pump, like it's pumping rocks, there's a lot of noise. Um, one of the common reasons is this cavitation is because your pumping lift is too high. And so you may look and see that you're trying to pump water uh, lift at 12 feet, and that could cause problems if, uh, compared to if your pumping lift is lower. And so that's one way you can help people if they have a problem. Take a look at that. Um, this next curve I'm showing is the exact same as the last one. <laughs> I just printed it out a little bit differently. Um, we'll talk about getting pump curves, but I just showed this one. I showed an 11-inch impeller and highlighted that line. I didn't show all the other impeller sizes. I just showed the envelope, what your max impeller size would be for this type of pump, what your minimum impeller size would be, and then what my selected impeller size would be. And so. It's just a different way of showing the same information as the last pump curve. And when I talked about the pump curve being flat, I better mention that before I move on. And so if I look at this pump curve and I design my pump, it's a 30 horsepower centrifugal pump, and I've designed it to give me 110 feet of head at 900 gallons per minute. That's what I need. So um, let's say I'm pumping to several hand lines and wheel lines. And um, the guy that's running the or moving the hand lines or wheel lines, he wants to shut half of them off. He doesn't have to shut the pump down, move them, and then turn them back on. So that's going to cause a big change in flow. If he shuts half the lines off, I reduce my flow rate to 450 gallons per minute. If I look at this pump curve, I come up, and my TDH is 450 gallons a minute is about 130 feet. At 900, it was 110 feet or so. There's a difference of 20 feet of head between those two points, and I reduced my flow in half. That 20 feet of head, if we convert it to CSI using our conversion factor of 2.31, is equivalent to almost 9 PSI. So I can cut my flow in half on this pump, and my pressure only goes up by 9 PSI. So I don't really, I'm not looking at a, a dangerous situation where I might blow up my main line or have problems with pressure. So that's one advantage of these centrifugal pumps. Just for pretty big, substantial variations in flow, you don't get big changes in pressure. This pump curve is for a turbine pump. <clears throat> and it's a, this one, I just pulled up a, a curve that was similar. I put in the the same design operating conditions of our, as our original pump. Um, and just to show you the kind of the difference, this is a steep pump curve. It's kind of set up the same way. You still have your horsepower lines and your efficiency lines, 
this one, the best efficiency point is at 85% as well. Um, one thing to note, if we do that same type of evaluation, for this pump, the design point was 1,000 gallons a minute. At 1,000 gallons per minute, um, we're looking at a TDH of about 160 feet. Let's say this is a similar system where the guy wants to move half his lines at one time. And so if he was to shut down half his lines and we decrease our flow rate to 500 gallons a minute, our TDH on the curve we read over would be 210 feet. And so instead of a, a 20 feet uh, change in head, now we have a 50 feet change. And that's equivalent to about 22 PSI. And so by changing that amount, our pressure jumped 9 PSI. In this case, it would jump 22 PSI. And really, that's, that's not too bad for a turbine pump. Um, this is a, a turbine pump with more of a, a flat curve compared to other turbine pumps, actually, now that I look at it. But you can still see the difference. This is a substantially steeper than our centrifugal pump. It's basically set up the same way. Um, just looking at this, making sure I covered everything I want to cover on this turbine pump. Um, if you look at this, this on the left, you're looking at impeller trims again. Um, and so this, for this pump, the maximum impeller diameter would be 9.188 inches. The minimum would be 8.125. You could trim that impeller anywhere in between those two, and then your curve would basically parallel the other curve to whatever point you're at, and you could kind of see how it would operate. Um, if you have a turbine pump, you can look at the curve like this one, but the bottom that tells you that this is a lane vertical line pump. Um, it tells me what catalog it's from, what my design point was, not something that I had specified. It tells me the model number at the bottom. This is a Vertiline 12 RL, and it has three stages. We talked about stages. That means it has three different moles. Now, your performance and efficiency are going to vary with, the, with each one, depending on the number of stages. So that's pretty good information. And then it also tells me that this particular pump, the impeller diameter is 9.188 inches. So it's a full trim. Um, you know, that's another term you make with pumps. Is it trimmed or is it a full trim? If it's a full trim, it's a full impeller diameter. Um, where to go to get pump curves? The USDA NRCS has a really good site. And I, I'm going to try and just pull this up and show you. <laughs> then get back to my PowerPoint. And hopefully, hopefully we don't get too messed up here. Um, but they have a really good site. I've given you the link, and it has a bunch of old pump curves. And so if I pull up, or if I'm looking at an existing pump and I need to find a pump curve, I may go to this site. There we go. Oops. There we go. And then um, it has a lot of different pump curves they've collected over the years. And so I can look down through, and these are all the different pump manufacturers. And so if we look, uh, American Turbine's the main one, American Marsh, Aurora, a lot of these main manufacturers. And so I can, if I know the manufacturer of the pump, I can go to their site. And we'll look at one we've already looked at. Um, Lane and Vertiline, those are two different pumps and they combined. And that's why we talk to Lane Vertiline. But if I go and look at Vertiline pumps, just click on that. And it brings up several different options. This is, this is basically pump RPM that I'm looking at. This is the pump speed. So there are 1,200 RPM pumps, 1,800 RPM pumps, and then all the difference, and 3,600 is the other main one. <clears throat> if you're looking at an irrigation pump, there's probably going to be either an 1,800 RPM pump or 3,600. And 1,800 is usually the most common. And so I'm just going to find the curve we were just looking at, the vert line. So I click on 1,800 RPM. And it lists all the different model numbers of the pumps that they have available. And if I go down to 12RL, that's what we were looking at, the 12RL. 
click on that, it should bring up the pump curve. Now this looks a little bit different than the other one because the other one I got off of the um, off of Birdline's website, and we'll look at different websites here in just a second. And this pump, my other pump was a three-stage pump. The pump curve that you'll probably find on this site will be a per-stage pump. That means it shows the pump performance with just one stage, and then you need to add stages on <laughs> in order to calculate what the actual pump performance is. So for example, the last one at 1,000 gallons a minute, we were at close to 150 feet, if I remember right. And so this says for each stage, we have about 50 feet of head per stage at 1,000 gallons a minute. And I can just add those on. So if I have three stages, uh, my total head is 50 times three. And so you just add those on. and. And, and that matches up with what the other pump curve shows uh, at 150 feet with three stages. So there is, is that. And then I'll go back. We look at the Cornell pump. There's Cornell. There we go. Um, 1800 RPM, we should be able to find the same pump we were just looking at. We were looking at a 4RB. I can select that. And so if you're working with a farmer and you have information on their pump and you want to get their pump curve for them and maybe see how pressure will change with different flows, yeah, you can come here and grab the pump curve. And this one looks a little bit different as well for the same reason. This is an older curve and I got the newest one off of their website that we were looking at earlier. All right, now I just need to figure out how to get that presentation to work again. Huh? There we go. Now, another good resource is the Pump Flow website. It gives you more of an updated pump curve. And if you go to the site list, it brings you up to this screen. Um, you can buy Pump Flow Premium, or you can use Pump Flow Select for free. Pump Flow Premium has some additional uh, benefits that if you want to pay for, you can get more information and it works a little nicer. So if we just look at Pump Flow Select, we can click on that. It asks, are you sure you don't want to buy Pump Flow Premium? We'll say, yeah, we'll just use Pump Flow Select for now. And it has pump curves for a lot of the different manufacturers. Um, you can see all the similar ones to what were listed on the USDA site. It's going to bring up a more current pump curve, and we can specify what we want to see. So here's the Cornell pump. We were looking at those. I select the Cornell pump. Um, it'll tell me I have to start the pump selection. I can hit that button, and I can do either do a design point search or I can look at the catalogs for different pump types. And so if I wanted to find a pump that would give me, oh, let's say 100 feet of head, or 1,000 gallons per minute at 130 feet of head, it'll look at all of the Cornell pumps and pick one that will meet my design operating condition. And we'll just maybe do that quickly. Um, there are some other selections here. We'll do a clear liquid pump, 1800 RPM. And this, if we click search, it should bring up a list of pumps that would meet those requirements. Here's our good old 4RB that we were looking at. They have a 5RB pump that would work, a model 4HH pump that would work. And then I can just select which one. Usually they put the best bit at the top. I can select that pump. And um, it brings up and it says, if I wanted to meet those design operating conditions, my 4RB pump would have a trim of 12.0625 inches. And so, and so that's useful. Um, we can look at catalogs, too. Go back, start pump selection, and then click on catalogs. Uh, it's not working for me. So instead of play around with that. We'll go out and we'll just go directly to one of the manufacturer's websites. 
And so if I look at Cornell, since we're talking Cornell, I can go right directly to Cornell's company website. And I can do this with most manufacturers. And they have a pump curve program where I can generate a pump curve from their site. This one, I think I have too much going with my internet. Um, under this, this one, they have a link to their pump flow, which is their pump selector. They use pump flow to, and I can either download it to my computer, or I can use the the online version. Make sure that looks like it's one. Download. I don't want to download. Let's try this. Okay, yep, it takes me straight to their pump selection tool. And I can get to it from websites. If for some reason I can't find something on pump floor, if it's not working, and go directly to the manufacturer's website. Um, here it lets me manually select what pump I want to look at. Um, if I tell it it's a clear liquid pump, 1800 RPM. It'll bring up all of their pumps that meet that criteria. Now I could select the model number that I'm interested in. So anyway, I, if you're an engineer, this is kind of fun being able to look at different pump curves. You guys might be pretty bored with it, <laughs> and so I'll just uh, move out of there and just kind of finish just to end off or end the presentation here. I know we're almost out of time. Um, I just have some pictures of some different different pumps. I'll just go over them quickly and then we can have, if you have any questions, we can answer them now or we can hit them tomorrow too. Um, this is a, a centrifugal pump. <clears throat> this pipe is the suction pipe that comes from a ditch into the inlet of the pump and then this is the discharge. This pump would be considered flooded suction so you're not lifting the water. Actually, the water level in the ditch is higher than the pump, and so you never have to prime this pump. Um, we didn't really talk about that, but that's one nice way to set up a centrifugal pump without priming it. Um, there's a, another picture of a centrifugal pump. It is lifting the water out of the ditch. Um, it looks like the water might be close enough to the level of the pump that they may not need to prime this one because it doesn't really have a primer pump on it. Um, there's a picture of a a different application for a centrifugal pump. That's a centrifugal pump, but they turned it upside down, so the suction side is straight up and down, and they're discharging out the side. And so when the motor sits right on top of the way they set this one up. There's a picture of a vertical turbine pump pumping out of a ditch. The bowls are down in the water in this concrete pump pit. Um, this is just a screen system, and it shows the discharge and the electric motor right on top. There's a, another picture of two turbine pumps side by side, two separate pumps. There's an irrigation ditch back here in the background, and there are pipes from that ditch, uh, screen and pipe system over here to the pump pump. Then this is a picture of a deep well turbine pump. If I remember right, this was, a, it was maybe a 600 horsepower pump. This is the well pump, and so it's pumping from probably 600 feet. Um, clear down there, and then this over on the side, the picture doesn't show up very well, but this is a centrifugal booster pump. So the water comes out and it can either go straight if the booster pump's not running, or it can run through the booster pump and back into the system when they need the booster. This pump, I wish it showed up a little bit better. It's not a close coupled pump like we've seen. It actually has a shaft between the pump and the motor, and it's called actually a, a split flow um, um, and so it's, it's a little stuff, a little different. It's had a better picture. But anyway, that's um, all I have for today. Are there any questions? That was great, Rick. Thank you so much. I really appreciate all the, I'm sure we all do, all the photos and diagrams. That was really helpful. Does anybody have any questions? If you go through, if you if you look through the presentation and the slides, um, when you have a chance, if you and then have any questions, we can always we'll have time to answer them tomorrow too. 
Excellent. And uh, same time, same place tomorrow. I'm just about to send you a, an invite. So it will look just like the, the GoToMeeting invite for today. I waited until, I'm going to wait until now to send it. I didn't want everybody confused with which one to, um, which invite to use. So I'm going to go ahead and send that now. And again, the sessions um, will be posted along with the PowerPoint presentations too will be posted um, on the Peaks to Prairies website under the E3 page. Sarah, did you have anything else? I do have a quick question, Rick. Um, when we're looking at an irrigation pump versus, say, a direct uh, pumping situation like we do on a solar or wind submersible situation where we're going directly from a pump into a tank, am I correct in assuming that we have more options for controlling the TDH with an irrigation pump than we would in a, in a direct pumping application? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And, and really, it depends on your system. Um, one thing that we have, if I can just pull up um, this really quick. If we look at the, the pump curve right here. And so um, usually you have a system curve with the irrigation pumps. And then the system curve just basically shows you how it's basically like a pump curve with your system at certain pressures, your flow can change. And, and this blue line on this pump represents a kind of a fake system curve. Mm -hmm. But that changes. And then really, your TDH depends on your system. Like with your direct pump, if you're pumping to have a soft water pump, you're pumping right out of the ground into a tank, um, your TDH is going to change slightly depending on the water level in your tank, unless you're just up in at the top. And then it's going to stay at the same. With an irrigation system, it's going to change depending on um, what's running on your system. For example, if I have multiple center pivots on my system and one is turned off, then my flow rate's going to decrease and my TDH is going to change accordingly. I don't know if that answers your question or not. It does. Thanks. Otherwise, I didn't have anything else, Myla. Thanks. OK, well, thanks, Rick. Um, any follow-up questions, we'll get back with you tomorrow. So talk to you all then. Sounds great. Thank you. Thanks for the great presentation. Thanks.